Hello and welcome everyone to our briefing today, Leveraging Grid ed Edge Integration for Resilience and Decarbonization. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. ESI works hard to provide informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in written materials and on social media. All of our educational resources, briefings like this, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and now even podcasts are always available for free online. And we are always posting new information. Just yesterday, we published a new issue brief about the potential for autonomous vehicles as a climate solution. And readers of our biweekly Climate Change Solutions newsletter were treated on Tuesday to new articles about the major funding and leverage increase proposed by the Biden-Harris administration for USDA's Rural Energy Savings Program, and also the planned phase down of hydrofluorocarbons. I really cannot imagine why anyone interested in climate policy is not already a subscriber to climate change solutions, but I suppose you never know. So just in case, a plug, the best way to keep track of our work and access our resources is to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for climate change solutions. And it also helps if you follow us on Twitter at EESI online. Today is the third and final installment of our new briefing series, Modernizing the U.S. Energy System opportunities, challenges, and the path forward. We started on June 4th by imagining the infrastructure investments needed today to strive towards the energy system of tomorrow. And on June 11th, we focused our attention on modernizing America's transmission network. If you missed either of these first two sessions, you can watch the archived webcast uh, if you visit us online at www.eesi.org. Our session today, Leveraging grid, ed, grid Edge Integration for Resilience and Decarbonization was originally scheduled for last Friday, but out of respect and observance for the new Juneteenth holiday, we moved it ahead to today. So thank you very much for your understanding in our change of plan, with our change of plans. And thanks for joining us today. As it worked out by coincidence, given all the recent developments in infrastructure discussions and the importance of greenhouse gas emissions reductions and whatever set, set of packages come together, our topic is even more timely than we'd hoped. And also joining us today is a very special guest to help us kick off the discussion. It is my privilege to introduce Representative Peter Welch of Vermont. Uh, after distinguished service in the Vermont State Senate, Representative Welch was elected to the House of Representatives in 2006. Today, he is a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, he is a tireless champion of energy efficiency, and he has a true gift for finding areas of bipartisan agreement across a wide range of policy areas. So let's welcome Representative Welch to our webcast today. Thank you, Dan Brissett, and thank you, Environmental and Energy Study Institute, for allowing me to say a few words. This meeting you're having about the we face on climate change in a bit of context. The last administration, there was a lot of denial, as though it, climate change didn't exist, as though it wasn't a threat. In fact, people knew it was a threat and knew it existed. The holdback was a lot of fear about what would happen as we face the challenge of moving from a carbon-based economy uh, to renewable energy in an efficiency-based economy. And those of you who are here understand there's immense economic opportunity in taking on the challenge to implement this transformation that our country and our environment and our world needs. And it is by facing the challenge, not by denying it, that we're actually going to create a stronger economy. And what's exciting to me as a member of Congress, with all the challenges that we face, is that that's the side of the environmental debate that we're on, how to do it, how to do it in a way that's effective, that creates stronger communities, better local jobs. And you're on the forefront of doing practical things to allow us to reduce carbon emissions as we create jobs. So you're on the forefront and it's exciting and the challenges are real 
they're immense and they take a talent and they take discipline and they co take cooperation. But I'm seeing that we're getting some bipartisan support finally uh, for some of the measures we need to take. I'm working with uh, Representative McKinley from West Virginia on our Hopes for Homes uh, effort, uh, make our homes much more energy, energy efficient by providing some tax incentives, but then the know-how, how to do it, the connection with the web, how that's going to interact and keep down carbon emissions, who's going to do the jobs. That's all going to be the private sector uh, with practical folks coming up with practical solutions. Uh, we need a renewable energy standard, and I'm introducing legislation with my friend from New York, Representative Clark, and that's going to create a lot of incentive for our utilities to engage in f faster with renewable energy. So I'm seeing that there is a increase in real interest in Washington on the policymaker side to provide those policies that give you the tools that you need to use the grid edge efforts that you're making that are going to reduce carbon emissions and help us finally address aggressively climate change from carbon emissions that have to have to be reduced. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you uh, for allowing me to say a few words. And I look forward to being your partner in this important work that we must face together. Thank you. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Welch, for joining us today. It's always really great to see you. And I look forward to when we can welcome you back uh, at in-person briefings, which hopefully won't be too much longer into the future. Um, and also, let me just say a quick um, thanks to your excellent staff who helped us um, uh, arrange for your participation in our briefing today. And they are just about the nicest and easiest people to work with on Capitol Hill. So thanks to you and thanks to them for joining us. And now after hearing from Representative Welch, I feel like we can move right to the panel. Um, as, well, as usual, we will leave time at the end of our session uh, for some discussion. And if you have a question or comment in our audience today, let us know. Um, you can send us your questions two different ways. The first is by sending us an email. And the email address is eesi at eesi.org. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online. And if you send us your question, we'll do our best to incorporate your input into the conversation. Uh, and now let me introduce the first of our four panelists today. Uh, Monica Newcomb is the Technology Manager for Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, or GEB, in the Energy Department's Building Technologies Office. She holds a master's degree in public policy, energy, and public finance from the University of Maryland, and a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Oregon. Welcome, Monica. Um, uh, when you turn your video on, it will be great to see you, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to EESI for um, having me on today, and I'm excited to be able to provide a quick update here on the National Roadmap on Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, I'll just be saying GEBS from now on, um, that we recently published. I uh, hope you are able to uh, check out the report. We have the website right here, or you can um, download it and read through um, a pretty short, actually, report with quite a few details in the appendix. Um, and I just want to also give credit to the authors of this report, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the Brattle Group are the, the primary authors of the report. Uh, so I'm going to go through just a quick introduction sort of of what, what is a GEB, why GEB, and then um, I would walk through two of sort of the key elements of the report. Um, one key aspect of the report was analysis, so I'll give a quick update on that, and then we'll walk through some of the key recommendations of the report as well. So what, what is a grid interactive efficient building and, and why do we need them? Um, really, you know, at, at BTO, where I work, the Building Technologies Office, we've we spent a lot of our time focused on energy efficiency. And I'd say for about the last five years, we've really looked to broadening um, energy efficiency to also be thinking more about load management. So in addition to reducing the overall energy efficiency, also looking to see when you can change the timing of your energy, um, the amount of it, and also sort of when you can modulate or quickly shift some of the energy use. Um, and we're finding the need to do that. Really, that was um, we started expanding our work based on, on stakeholder feedback. Um, 
a lot of the states who are working um, are exploring and you know really see the, the supply, side, supply side changing with the growing share of um, variable renewable energy. Um, really we're look, see the need for solution also on the demand side through greater um, load management. And in addition to renewables, there's also just increasing trends towards um, you know, decarbonization goals and greater um, electrification through vehicles and even building equipment that will also um, really require better um, demand side management. And then in addition to those trends, just the overall um, ability through demand flexibility and energy efficiency to reduce costs, replacing aging um, you know, system infrastructure and improving system reliability. And then um, definitely not last, but it's the last on my list here. Um, from the consumer perspective, um, in addition to reduce um, you know, electricity bills, also just greater options um, for control of building equipment. Demand flexibility really requires um, more controls and equipment, and so then that allows um, essentially, you know, consumers to have smart buildings and able are able to control their equipment and have sort of um, better ability to align with their preferences. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, we can get a little bit more of the details of what is a GEB. Um, all right. So. <clears throat> um, Grid, I'm just, the, the definition really, uh, or the vision that we work on at um, BTO of a GEB are energy efficient buildings with smart technologies that are characterized by the active use of distributed, distributed energy resources to optimize energy use for grid services, occupant needs, and preferences and cost reductions in a continuous and integrated way. So that's a very long definition that has a lot packed into it. But really our vision is one of, um, you know, where buildings uh, are more automated and are able to respond to signals um, to change uh, the energy use. Um, so as I mentioned, the GAB really, the, the foundation of it is efficiency and um, reducing the amount of energy that's needed to operate the, the building um, in a persistent way. But then in addition, um, being connected and, you know, most buildings are connected today to the grid, but we're looking for, again, really is two-way um, communication where your, a building is able to receive a signal and then also respond back to the grid. Um, and then in addition to being connected, uh, the building really needs to have a system or equipment that is smart. So they're able to, um, through sensors and controls, uh, uh, take in signals or um, be able to optimize for um, different preferences or needs um, in order to allow for that shifting or shedding of energy use. And then lastly, again, it's flexible. Um, you know, we're really looking at sort of traditional building equipment along with um, DERs and, and storage and optimizing all that in order to reduce shift or modulate energy use. So that was just a quick overview of um, what is it, what is a GEB? And so then moving on to, we want to move to the next slide, um, the different uh, elements of a, um, of the actual roadmap. So the next two slides I'm going to talk through is just uh, the overall potential or sort of the analysis that we, we found through the roadmap. So the top line finding is that GEBS can save um, between 100 to 200 billion in power system costs by 2040. The range in benefits is driven by different assumptions about future adoption rates and future energy and capacity um, costs. So we looked at low, mid, and high adoption in the report. Um, most of the findings are, are focused on sort of the mid-adoption uh, mid perspective. Uh, between roughly half and three-quarters of the total system benefits come from reduced energy costs driven largely by the energy savings of uh, energy efficiency measures and avoid or defer generation and transmission capacity costs due to reductions in system peak demand account for the vast majority of the remaining benefits. <clears throat> You'll find in the report the slightly lower costs or the lower system value of GEBS under the high renewables case is due to lower marginal energy costs and the associated reduced benefits from energy efficiency. Um, however, in that case, demand flexibility benefits from more variable energy costs through greater opportunities um, <clears throat> to shift load from higher cost hours to lower cost hours. Uh, I think that's um, a good summary for that slide. So we move to the next one. We also um, quantified the benefits from an emissions perspective. 
And on a national basis, GEBS would reduce the national CO2 emissions by roughly 80 million tons, or 6% of total power um, sector emissions annually by 2030. The primary driver of the emissions reductions is the decrease in fossil fuel-based electricity generation due to lower, lower overall electricity demand. Additionally, changes in the timing of the electricity consumption through demand and flexibility measures and technologies can result, result in proportionally more electricity being consumed during hours with lower emissions, um, for instance, middle of the day in a utility system with high solar deployment. Uh, we also found, as you can see here, significant regional variation. Regions that are more reliant are on carbon intensive generation resources, such as the upper Midwest or which, which do not have plans to serve new loads through cleaner resources will provide a greater opportunity for emission savings through EE or energy efficiency and demand flexibility. And then I also just note that emission benefits were um, somewhat conservative because the demand flexibility measures were controlled and dispatched to reduce system co cost. If um, in the analysis that we had dispatched the demand flexibility measures to optimize emissions reductions, the benefits would greater. So if we move to um, the next slide, or the next few slides then are just going to go through recommendations for accelerated GEB adoption. Um, the report looks at four different pillars. Pillar one is looking at advancing GEB through research and development. Pillar two is enhancing the value of demand flexibility to consumers. Uh, pillar three is looking at empowering um, people and users. And then pillar four really looks at supporting uh, demand flexibility through enabling programs and policies. So I'm going to get into details on each of these. Um, so pillar one, looking at um, research and, and development, there are three key recommendations here. Um, and then on the slide, I have an example uh, action. I'm not going to get, not going to read through all of these, but just I'll quickly take through the recommendations. The first one is really looking at um, continuing to do research around um, GEB technologies. In, in particular there, there's a real opportunity around thermal energy storage, as well as um, looking at um, <clears throat> HVAC systems. We find there's a really good connection between um, you know, load management and electrification. And so that will be an area of continued focus for um, BTO. Um, also, critically important to all this is interoperability. There's this um, consistently we hear this across um, from all stakeholders, really the need to make sure that the technologies are interoperable and focusing on um, developing standards around that. And then the last recommendation here is just making sure that um, we're able to uh, provide data and access the data um, with increased you know, benchmark data sets and benchmarking tools. So if we move to the next slide, pillar two, this is really looking at enhancing the value proposition from um, both in consumer and utility perspective. Um, and you know, the first two recommendations here improve and expand innovative customer demand flexibility program off offerings and um, consumer knowledge and consideration consideration of price-based programs are really making sure that there are incentives in place for um, people who want to have their homes or you know, their offices or buildings um, to actually participate and prov provide the demand flexibility. Today, there really aren't very many incentives in place. And um, you know, there, there needs to be an increase in this in order for people to uh, offer up demand flexibility. And then the last two recommendations here are looking for, you know, providing incentives for utilities want to want to deploy demand flexibility and then incorporating um, demand flexibility and utility resource planning. We believe that these two elements um, from a utility perspective would really um, help increase the overall sort of market participation. Um, the third pillar, in, in my opinion, is just so critical, um, empowering people to, to you know, um, better understand uh, how to interact with smart technologies. Um, and, you know, and critically here, this last recommendation is focusing on the workforce. Uh, this goes all the way from, you know, uh, installation of the sort of sensors and um, the systems that allow for more of the automation um, to people actually then, whether, you know, in commercial buildings being able to use the equipment and sort of 
understand the data analytics that are, are driving some of the changes. And then, um, you know, the ongoing maintenance, whether it's uh, contractors coming in to, to fix the technology or just um, people at home being able to maintain the technology, we feel like this is a really critical piece that needs to be worked on in order for people to really be more comfortable with smart buildings in order to um, optimize all that they have to offer. And then the last pillar is looking at, um, you know, increasing deployment through state and federal programs and policies. Uh, the first one here, lead by example, we found a lot of, um, you know, benefits from energy efficiency. And we think if we can expand some of those programs to include demand flexibility, be a great way to um, sort of increase trust in, um, in uh, demand flexibility. Um, there, there definitely needs to be increased uh, funding and financing uh, for GEB technologies. Uh, we know a number of states are looking at expanding codes and standards um, to also incorporate demand flexibility. Um, and then just also states, you know, considering sort of in incorporating demand flexibility in targets or mandates as well to um, help increase uh, demand flexibility to just be uh, more common um, in programs. And then last, I'll just end on, uh, in this report, DOE has established a goal of tripling energy efficiency and demand flexibility by 2030 um, relative to 2020 levels. And we, we you know, stand ready to work with uh, states and, and a number of stakeholders. Right now we have three working groups. Uh, one with um, states, another with utilities, and then a third with commercial building owners. And we could, we plan to continue and expand on those efforts. Um, one of the things that, the, you know, in the report through the recommendations for each of the recommendations, we would call out sort of the key stakeholders that are really critical um, to the success of the recommendations. And, and so um, just want to end that uh, we, you know, we're excited to continue this work at DOE and working with all the key stakeholders who are necessary um, to really accelerate um, demand flexibility for the future. That's a great kickoff presentation um, for our panel today, Monica. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, you know, just a quick plug, you know, Monica's presentation covered good interactive efficient buildings, but, you know, it's almost impossible to find work at the building technologies office that will not deliver a ton of cost effective emissions reduction. So folks in our audience, um, I hope you'll go back and, and look at Monica's presentation um, and visit uh, the links that she recommended and you know, take a moment to um, peruse the uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energies, Building Technologies Office, Building Energy Codes, Appliance and Equipment Standards, Building America Asset Score. There's a ton of cool work going on at the Department of Energy around um, buildings and, and emissions reductions. I just encourage everyone to go take a look at it. It is very cool stuff. And um, GEB is uh, especially cool, but there's just a ton of great stuff going on at BTO. So thank you so much, Monica, for joining us today. Um, I now get to introduce our second panelist. Um, Elion Bitar is currently an associate professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell University. Prior to joining Cornell in fall 2012, he was engaged as a postdoc fellow uh, in the Department of Computing and Mathematical Science at the California Institute of Technology and at the University of California, Berkeley in electrical engineering and computer science. Um, Elion, it is wonderful to welcome you to the panel today. I really can't wait for your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and thank you to everyone else at EESI for the, the kind invitation. Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting opportunity to speak to uh, everyone out there in YouTube land. Um, but let me share my screen. Okay, so today uh, I'll spend a little bit of time discussing the impacts that electric vehicles will have on the grid as the, the, we transition to a greater reliance on EVs for transportation. Um, I'll talk about different possible futures related to how we manage the integration of electric vehicles. Um, and I'll discuss the enormous potential that electric vehicles might provide uh, in terms of, to the grid in terms of serving as assets, as resources that can improve the efficiency, the resilience and the sustainability of our power systems. 
So um, electric vehicles are coming. I mean, you may have been hearing a lot about this in the news, both in terms of you know, various automakers uh, uh, pledging to completely electrify their fleets in the coming years. GM has said that they'll go all electric by 2035. Uh, Volvo similarly has said that they'll go all electric by 2030. And many other automakers are investing heavily in terms of R&D to increase their ability to electrify their fleets and manufacture, okay, producing batteries to, to, to build these vehicles. Um, so today, electric vehicles, they, they're really a tiny fraction of all vehicles on the road. Uh, they're roughly 2%, they represent 2% of all new vehicles sold in the United States today. Um, but the rate of adoption is accelerating and it's going to accelerate very aggressively. And this is driven primarily by declining costs. Um, and, and that's really uh, due to declining battery costs. Uh, in this figure here, I've, uh, I've, I've uh, plotted the battery costs from 2013 to 2020, and you see per kilowatt hour, um, battery costs have decreased from roughly $600 per kilowatt hour to $137 per kilowatt hour. So to put that in perspective, uh, a Tesla Model 3 with 100, 220 miles range would have costs, according to these numbers, $33,000 just for the battery in 2013. In 2020, that same battery would cost roughly $6,000, okay? So this is a dramatic decrease in costs and they're expected, electric vehicles are expected to reach price parity with uh, more traditional internal combustion engine-based vehicles by 2025 uh, uh, to 2026. So that's, that's coming very soon. Uh, but one of the big questions that, 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 that everyone's asking, uh, policymakers, utilities, system, op grid system operators, is, is the grid ready? Is the grid prepared for the increase in demand, electricity demand that electric vehicles are going to bring? Okay. And so the, the short answer is, it depends. And it depends how we manage this increase in demand. And so in the coming slides, I'll describe various scenarios that correspond to different approaches to managing this load. And I'll show how those different scenarios will result in different impacts, okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to discuss the greenhouse gas emission impacts and potential that electric vehicles might bring to the grid. It's, it's, it's a little bit subtle and, and uh, it depends again on how we will manage this load. So uh, to, to help frame the discussion, I'll describe a, a pilot study that we recently completed with uh, New York State Electric and Gas in, in upstate New York, uh, exploring these various scenarios for residential electric vehicle charging. Uh, I should say this is joint work with my graduate student, Paulina Alexinko. Uh, she's really, you know, has been the driver for everything we've done here. Um, and so, you know, all the mistakes are mine and all of the outstanding results are hers. Um, and using that pilot study, I'll discuss, uh, one, the impacts that unmanaged electric vehicle charging can have on the grid and how we might be able to harness the latent flexibility in electric vehicles in terms of how they charge to minimize this impact and strain on the grid and various other opportunities that this flexibility might present to uh, improve grid efficiency, resilience, and sustainability. And then I'll... Uh, close by discussing a few other opportunities and potential risks that might accompany this transition. Okay. So let, let me just briefly describe the pilot that we carried out. Uh, this was a real world study and involved 35 electric vehicle owners in Tompkins County, New York. That's where Cornell University sits. Uh, each of the participants was equipped with a level two charger, charging station in their homes. Um, those were rated at seven and a half, roughly seven and a half kilowatts max power. To give you a sense of, you know, what, you know, seven kilowatts roughly amounts to, you know, your average, that's roughly three times the peak power of your average U.S. household, okay? So residential uh, electric vehicle chargers, level two chargers, will potentially dramatically increase peak loads. Um, because of, uh, because of the, this, this large potential to draw power. Um, so in this pilot, we studied three scenarios. 
unmanaged electric vehicle charging. So what that essentially amounts to is allowing customers to begin charge, to charge their vehicles anytime they want. So when they plug in, they begin charging at the maximum rate until the vehicle is fully charged. Uh, we also examined uh, uh, different approaches to managing that charging. One approach is focused on using time of use prices, charging customers different prices at different hours of the day to incentivize them to maybe shift their load to certain hours of the day where prices are cheaper. And then a third approach that involves a more direct form of control, where we actually take control of their chargers um, and centrally optimize how the different electric vehicles draw power to minimize strain on the grid. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about these three scenarios. But before I do, I want to just kind of uh, describe this, this picture I have here to the right. So the, this black curve represents kind of nominal power demand for roughly 70 households in, in the region where we explored, the, uh, where we were carrying our pilot out. Um, so you see that roughly in the evening, 7 and 8 p.m. load peaks at around 120 kilowatts. In the figure above, what I've done is I've plotted data that reflects the distribution of times that people plug their electric vehicles in. That's this blue curve. And so what you see is that people tend to plug their cars in when they come home from work, right? In between 5 and 7 p.m. And so the, the this blue curve here is peaking during those hours. Um, the red curve represents the distribution of un unplugged times so when people plug their vehicles from the chargers. And again, what you see is in the residential environment, people tend to leave you know, in the morning when they leave for work. And so I'll talk about the implications of these distributions in a moment. But if we look at the arrival times when people plug in, you see that that aligns with kind of the baseline peak demand. And so if people begin charging as soon as they plug in, we should expect to see an amplification of peak load. And so the, the data, in fact, reveals that. Um, you see that, uh, so each one of these slivers here represents the electricity demand of a different electric vehicle in the pilot. Um, and because people tend to arrive during peak hours of the day, you see that it, that results in a dramatic increase in peak load. And the potential consequences of this increase in peak load is that it's potentially going to exhaust the distribution systems, the power systems capacity to serve that demand, whether that corresponds to kind of the transformers that you see in your local distribution network, or maybe even the substations that interface that network with the high voltage transmission system. Um, but what, returning back to this figure that kind of depicts the plug-in times and unplugged times, what you see is that when people begin charging in the evening, right, as soon as they plug in, they tend to finish or complete charging before their departure time the following morning. Okay, so what that reveals is that there's some underlying flexibility in those loads in the sense that they don't need to be charged immediately as soon as customers plug in um, uh, because they have this, this, this kind of slack in their minimum charge time and their expected departure times. And so that, you know, immediately kind of leads one to, to, to think that, okay, well, you know, can we provide incentives for customers to shift load from off-peak to, sorry, from on-peak to off-peak hours? And and many utilities have, have, have explored this possibility using what's known as time of use pricing. Um, and what time of use pricing uh, uh, essentially amounts to is you have during on peak hours, you charge a certain price, a high price. And during off peak hours, you charge another price, a lower price. And so in principle, customers who are flexible should shift their loads from on peak to off peak hours. So let's see what happens when you expose customers to these kinds of price incentives. Um, so what ends up happening is you end up seeing a sharpening and actually an increase in peak load in certain scenarios. So the load under time of use pricing, if you compare the peaks, is actually larger than the load you would see under unmanaged charging. And the reason that happens is because of the synchronizing effect that time of use prices have on load. Everybody programs their charger to begin charging at the start of the offbeat period. And what that does is that kind of synchronizes the times at which people start charging, thereby increasing the peak, even though this peak is happening in the middle of the night. Um, and so, 
to address this challenge, we, we asked ourselves, well, is there a different kind of mechanism that one might develop to leverage this latent flexibility in people's uh, uh, charge windows without inducing these unintended consequences of increased peaks? Um, and the idea that we propose is very simple. So instead of uh, providing customers time of use prices, what you do is you ask them for their deadlines, when they need their vehicle charged by. The longer they're willing to delay, the less they pay for their electricity. In exchange, given a deadline, the utility or whoever's coordinating these loads can coordinate how all the electric vehicles charge in a way to minimize their impacts on the grid while ensuring that everyone's vehicles charged by its deadline. Okay, so everybody gets their energy when they need it by, and those loads can be coordinated in a way to minimize their impacts on the grid. And so using this mechanism, we are able to realize uh, the load here depicted in green. And again, each one of these slivers represents a different electric vehicle charging on the network. And so you've been able to completely eliminate the effects of electric vehicle load on uh, uh, peak load. Um, now, I, the, you know, the way we actually executed this was through the use of two-way communication control, and we were actually adjusting the power being drawn by every vehicle on a minute-by-minute -minute time scale. And so that might kind of lead you to think, well, is there something more that one could do with this flexibility? Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about that uh, as it relates to the decarbonization potential of transportation electrification. So, I mean, one of the one of the primary drivers behind the push to electrify our transportation sector is the promise that that will reduce the transportation sector's impact on U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So, this is this is you know a really beautiful diagram that uh, was developed by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And what it shows here is a breakdown of how we produce energy in the United States on the left-hand side and how we consume that energy. And so if you look at the transportation sector here, the majority of energy that's supplied to the transportation sector comes from petroleum, okay, which obviously the burning of that fossil fuel uh, results in greenhouse gas emissions. If we were to displace a large fraction of this energy source with electricity, the extent of the impact that we would see on greenhouse gas emission reductions would ultimately depend on the mix of electricity generation, right? the generators that are supplying that electricity to power those electric vehicles. Um, and what you see today in the United States, uh, a large fraction of that electricity comes from fossil fuels, coal, and natural gas. And so if we're going to truly realize the transportation sector that has zero emissions, we're going to have to increase the share of electricity coming from renewables like wind and solar. Um, but that's challenging for, for a number of reasons. Um, the, the primary reason being that wind and solar power are intermittent. Okay? They're, they're, they're highly variable. Their, their power output can fluctuate on very rapid time scales. They're very difficult to forecast. And so that really complicates the challenge of balancing supply and demand when your source of energy, your supply is uncontrollable. Um, so because of this intermittency, there's a need to, 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 to back these resources up, either with conventional generation, like natural gas, or energy storage. The latter is a very costly proposition. However, as we electrify our transportation fleet, we're essentially transitioning to a system that looks like a large bank of batteries or small energy storage devices. And there's a emerges the possibility that you could coordinate these batteries okay, on wheels through optimized charging to absorb this intermittency. And so what that would give rise to is really a, a symbiotic relationship between electric vehicles and renewables. Uh, renewables, although clean, need to be balanced, backed up by either storage or dispatchable generation. Okay. If you're using dispatchable generation like natural gas, that mitigates the greenhouse gas benefit. Electric vehicles are, are clean if that electricity is being supplied by sustainable renewable energy resources like wind and solar. However, they're flexible. So that flexibility can be used to promote or support the integration of renewables. And so they really enable one another. 
And in the ability to orchestrate the kind of expansion of these two resources simultaneously promises what I, what I think uh, 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 is a very promising pathway to enable a, 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 a reliable transition to a high penetration, high renewable penetration power system and a largely electric transportation system. Um, and so I'll just kind of close by talking about, you know, some of the some of the additional opportunities and risks we might face as we transition to a, a, a transportation and power sectors that look like this. Um, so, I mean, one of the main points is if you if you leave electric vehicles to their own devices, right, allow them to charge in an unmanaged way, this is going to stress them and potentially require very costly infrastructure upgrades. Um, there is, however, uh, a tremendous amount of flexibility in electric vehicles. So you can use that flexibility to mitigate those impacts through smart charging or optimized charging, thereby increasing the utilization rate of your infrastructure. You can also use them to balance or help support the integration of renewables, intermittent renewables like wind and solar. And then even beyond that, right, these resources, electric vehicles, when aggregated, can be made to look like a giant battery and those batteries can provide other services to the grid energy services or reliability services um you know if we think about the the recent kind of winter freeze in texas and the, the uh, loss of power that many homes and people suffered um electric vehicles in some cases served as a source of backup power in some homes and so the ability to discharge your batteries back into the grid would allow you to essentially ride through blackouts for several days or indefinitely if you have solar on top of your home in addition to having an electric vehicle. And so uh, at scale, the proliferation, pro proliferation of electric vehicles has the potential to really increase the resilience of our power systems. Um, but, but there are some risks that come with this, uh, one of which has to do with as we increase the way in which we measure and control resources at the edge of the grid, using cellular communication networks with the internet, that's going to be accompanied by a risk, an increased risk of cyber attacks. And so it's crucial that we, we harden the cyber infrastructure that's used to, to manage these resources in a way that ensures that they're ultimately available when we need them and are not uh, subject to these risks of being hijacked by malicious adversaries. Um, so, I'll close with that. Um, and uh, uh, if, if you have questions that we're not able to address today, please feel free to reach out to me uh, through email. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was great. I'm, I really appreciate your graphs and your charts. It's really sometimes hard to visualize sort of how big the peaks are <laughs> uh, and, and how you can flatten them. And it's really, really helpful um, to be able to see that in your slides. So thank you so much for your presentation today. And you brought up a bunch of things that we're gonna get into a little bit more, I predict, uh, in our Q&A um, as well. So I encourage everyone to stick around for that. Um, I wanted to just mention two quick things. One was, um, if you liked what you just heard, um, you should also go back and rewatch or watch for the first time um, the presentation from Juan Torres um, on our, at our June 4th briefing. He is Associate Lab Director, Energy Systems Integration at NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And he talks about a lot of the same things, um, but from a more upstream perspective. And so I think that could be um, a great complimentary um, information resource for anyone who wants to dig into um, sort of what this looks like sort of at an even bigger scale. Um, and um, also while you're there, Jenny Chen and Daisy Robinson also had great presentations. I wouldn't, wanna, wouldn't want anyone to miss those as well. Um, also, um, if there are questions, and I see them coming in actually as we speak, um, uh, there are two ways to ask them. One is you can send us an email. The email address to use is eesi at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online. Um, our third panelist is uh, Janet Besser. She is managing director at the Smart, Ener Smart Electric Power Alliance, where she oversees strategy for the SEPA pathways regulatory and business innovation, grid integration and electrification, and leads content development and execution for regulatory innovation. She brings to this role uh, broad energy uh, industry experience as a regulator, clean energy business association leader, utility executive developer, consultant and consumer advocate, and soon to be EESI presenter. So J Janet, welcome to our panel today. I'm looking forward to your presentation.
Thank you very much, Dan. Had to quickly unmute myself there. And um, thank you very much to EESI for the inter invitation to participate today. Um, and following these two great panelists, I know I learned a lot from listening to them and hope I can contribute as well. So good afternoon. Um, as Dan said, I lead our work on regulatory and business innovation. Um, and let me tell you at the next slide a little bit about the Smart Electric Power Alliance. We have a vision of a carbon-free energy system by 2050, and our mission is to facilitate the electric power industry's smart transition to a clean and modern energy future. And what that means is that we want to make sure that uh, electricity remains affordable, reliable, safe, and resilient, as well as becomes increasingly carbon-free and clean. You go to the next slide. We are a membership organization. Uh, we have members that include utilities, what we call uh, including investor-owned utilities, cooperative utilities, and municipal utilities, as well as uh, utility agencies. We also have members uh, that we call solution providers, and these are the developers of the new technologies that are increasingly being deployed, from solar and wind developers to software developers to energy efficiency and demand response companies. One of the things that uh, we do as a nonprofit is we do research, education, collaboration, and standards. And one area of our research and expertise is supporting utilities, solution providers, customers, developers, and other industry stakeholders on planning for and designing microgrids for resilience. And that is what I'm going to talk about today. So if you go to the next slide, a quick overview of what a microgrid is. So I have here the DOE definition. It's a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within a clearly defined boundary that acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. So what does that mean? What it means is that when you have a microgrid, you have the ability to, be due, to generate power within that defined boundary. And then you can take the uh, boundary uh, and island it from the rest of the system when there is an instance of an outage. And this can happen automatically, it can be controlled. Um, but the important thing is that microgrids are being looked at increasingly by communities, customers, and utility systems as a way to manage resilience on the grid in the face of increasing storms and other natural disasters. So if you go to the next slide, the key thing when you're figuring out whether a microgrid is an opportunity for a particular set of customers or a community is identifying the value that it's going to provide to three key groups. Uh, Monica talked about the important constituencies of grid interactive efficient buildings, um, providing benefits for customers and communities in the utility system. And it's very similar for microgrids. So the key difference between this and other distributed energy resources is with the ability to island, they can provide backup power during an outage or an event. And this is the key source of their uh, value to customers, local governments, and the utility. Uh, the resilience triangle that you see here is taken from our microgrid playbook, which is about uh, community resilience for natural disasters. And I've got a link to that at the end of the presentation. And what you can see here is the, it's the intersection of value that really makes microgrids work. So customers want to avoid power outages. They may want to have uh, uh, control over their power quality, um, to, depending on what uh, they're, they're using electricity for. Communities want to make sure that their critical services aren't interrupted in the case of a storm. And we saw this as a big issue in the Northeast where I reside during Superstorm Sandy. Um, you want to be able to keep your fire, police, hospitals up and running in the face of an outage, particularly when the storm resulted in outages for some customers of up to a couple of weeks. Um, and the third constituency here are the utilities who want to maintain safe and affordable and efficient operations and leverage grid assets for distribution grid services. I'm not talking so much about it today, but microgrids can be used to provide other grid services that provide value to customers and communities and utilities, as well as critical value during outages. If you go to the next slide, 
what is needed to make microgrids work? It really is a confluence of the value streams to each of these three constituencies to make them economic. And there's some continuing gaps, um, things that we're still working on figuring out that relate to standards and common terminology, um, whether they're uh, proprietary systems that can't talk to each other, um, what is a utility business model that makes sense for deploying a microgrid? Um, what are some of the compensation mechanisms for either the microgrid provider or the developer or the customers? The regulatory frameworks under which all of this operates and then access to clean and resilient power. Fortunately, there are some potential solutions. And one of the things that we continue to work on at SEPA is advancing these solutions. So the lack of standards and common terminology uh, is problematic, but organizations like the National NIST, and I'm never gonna get this acronym right, the National Institute for Standards and something or other, um, but basically a standards organization run through the Department of Commerce provides resources to advance uh, standards and interoperability of frameworks. If you think about it, you've got the grid it has its own requirements, the microgrid has requirements, and the customer may have requirements, and they all need to be able to talk to each other and to work. Um, a key uh, area for additional work is a clear establishing a clear and consistent regulatory framework. And there are really two factors here. One is a regulatory framework that outlines what are the, are the roles of the utility, the microgrid developer, and the customer. And so in some cases, microgrid providers uh, can't use distribution wires that are owned by the utility. So you can clearly see that you need a lot of cooperation among these, pla uh, these players. Um, but in fact, you also need some consistency of understanding either in the state you're in, the community you're in, uh, or more broadly, with respect to reliability standards, is who's in charge of what and who's responsible for what in order to make this work. The other element that's really important for the utility in particular is clear and consistent guidance, clear and consistent guidance on how they can recover the costs that they need to incur to actually integrate and make use of microgrids. You have customers that have actually deployed microgrids for years. Hospitals generally have backup generation that can run their key and essential services. That is a form of a microgrid, a single user microgrid. Um, you have some microgrids that have been around that uh, serve not only the customer on who's, uh, at whose facility the generation may be located, but maybe a couple of other customers around. Um, but if in order to really capture value from this, the utility needs to make some investments in communications uh, controls, uh, uh, management, visibility, uh, in order to capture value for itself and all the other customers on the grid, as well as to facilitate the deployment of microgrids by key customers um, that need these essential services. There are a number of federal programs that have been really helpful. One is a DOE funded um, pilot and demonstration projects that are geared towards what, uh, exploring some of what we call regulatory sandboxes to understand what works and what doesn't. Um, one example is the Bronzeville Community Microgrid that Commonwealth Edison and Project Partners deployed. They received about $25 million in DOE grants that covered everything from technical to business model evaluations. Um, and based on their ability to leverage this funding, uh, ComEd was able to make the case to regulators for an innovative ownership model where ComEd is owning the storage and the microgrid controller assets and then putting out RFPs to DER developers for the distributed generation assets. And this makes it work for, for everybody. So one of the key things to think about is the fact that microgrids are all about partnerships and working together. Um, another successful federal program that's been really helpful is our uh, funds to state energy offices for renewables and energy efficiency, allowing the energy offices to fund stakeholder engagement and start and consider to plans for microgrids uh, that are focused on risk mitigation. Uh, SEPA has assisted a number of state energy offices in assessing opportunities for microgrids under this program. If you go to the next slide, you can see some of the resources that SEPA has available related to deployment and development of microgrids 
for community resilience and decarbonization. And actually, let me speak for a minute about decarbonization. As I said, microgrids have been around a long time. Uh, in the past, they have been uh, diesel backup generation has uh, fueled them, uh, maybe natural gas or oil. Increasingly, the focus is on renewable and clean microgrids that provide support uh, when the um, when the grid may go down or serve needs of customers that they have even in general, and sometimes to decarbonize for greater power quality, to have that assurance for resilience. So you think also not only about hospitals, police, fire, but military installations or another place where microgrids have been deployed. So you have now multiple objectives of states as they look at the opportunities for microgrids for resilience. And here you have links to some of the reports that I mentioned that can help state and local governments, customers and utilities plan for microgrids that can achieve resilience and decarbonization on the grid. If you go to the last slide, you'll see our contact information. And due to the rescheduling, I'm really standing in for Jared Leader, who is our uh, Senior Manager of Industry Strategy and focuses his work on microgrids. And so you can see his email address here and we'd welcome any questions that you have about the work we're doing to help uh, states and local communities uh, deploy microgrids for resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, and uh, thanks also to Jared who helped us uh, in the lead up to the briefing. and. Um, really appreciate, uh, Janet, your willingness to join us today. Um, we, uh, we understand that, um, that the scheduling issue from last week, um, when we made it for the right reason, but we understand that sometimes that causes some, some issues. So we really, really appreciate your willingness to jump in. And, Happy um, to be here. Up. And thanks, thanks once again to Jared. Um, excellent presentation. And again, if anyone wants to go back and look at Janet's slides, everything will be available um, online at www.esi.org. Um, our fourth and final panelist is um, uh, Dana uh, Cabell. She is a professional engineer who has enjoyed an impressive tenure uh, with Southern California Edison in the areas of transmission and distribution long-term planning. Presently, she is director of the SCE Integrated System Strategy, uh, ISS Group. Uh, Dana and her team are responsible for ensuring uh, SCE's transmission and distribution system is safe, resilient, reliable, clean, and affordable through well-informed strategic decisions regarding grid investments, integration of renewable and energy storage resources, enabling grid modernization, resiliency efforts, and reaching a carbon neutral electric grid, as well as many other things. Uh, Dana, welcome to the presentation, or welcome to the panel today. I will turn it over to you. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Dan. And I want to thank EESI also for the, the invitation to be part of this very important discussion. So let's move to the next slide. So where I want to start is um, back in 2019, it's Pathway 2045 Road. And really what this roadmap was outlining was how are we going to or what we need to do to enable a clean energy future in California. Uh, this in-depth analysis really concluded that there's three profound changes across the state's economy that are required to achieve 100% carbon neutrality by 2045. The, the first is to decarbonize the electric sector. As you were listening to some of the other panelists, you know, as we electrify the, our load as we're getting more transportation electrification, building electrification. What we were seeing within our analysis is that uh, across the 24 hour period or 87, 60 hours, we're going to see 60% increase in that energy demand. And on a peak load basis, about a 40% increase. So really to meet this demand from a resource perspective, you know, both the transmission and distribution grid will need to be able to integrate gigawatts of renewable energy and also uh, gigawatts of energy storage. So as we were studying this and trying to integrate the, the large amounts of uh, renewable generation and energy storage, we're seeing that it was, 
you know, the costs are going to be approximately $170 billion for these clean energy sources and $75 billion in grid investments by 2045. You know, the, the second, we decarbonize the other sectors of the economy. As we were talking here, you know, electrifying transportation and buildings. You know, we, the pathway white paper estimates a 20 million light duty 800,000 medium duty and 100,000 heavy duty electric vehicles will need to be added, uh, resulting in electrification of 75% 75, 75 of vehicles within California. You know, building electrification such as space and water heating in homes and businesses will need to grow more than 70%. So, and beyond the TE and BE, you know, the hard, elect hard to electrify industrial applications we need to switch over to more low carbon fuels like hydrogen and renewable natural gases, uh, including, uh, including to fuel synchronous generation sources for grid reliability if, if you have a major system disturbance. The third is to capture any remaining carbon through natural processes and engineering solutions so that with all of this, we, we can really achieve this 100% clean energy future. Now, as Pathway 2045 uh, really laid out what needs to change to achieve this uh, clean energy future, so what about the how? So if you, if you can go to the next slide. I'd like to talk and introduce a paper that, that Edison published in December of 2020. And it's, it's a white paper that is laying out how we achieve this future and we we've, we've kind of dubbed this as reimagining the grid and reimagining the grid or rtg uh, for short really seeks to address like i was saying the how the grid must change to support california's greenhouse gas reduction goals uh, as laid out in the high level uh, our systematic approach really begins with understanding the grid challenges. What our customers will need from the grid, how the supply mix will need to evolve, and how the regional climate change affects that, that the grid will need to endure and to ride through. In our starting point, we evaluated the impact these change drivers will have on the current grid, existing technologies and the physical topology of the grid. You know, in the development of the grid options, we, we looked at the unique needs and characteristics of the different SE regions or portions of our grid and really identified and focused on local grid challenges. Now, we prioritize the specific grid objectives and required capabilities uh, most relevant for each of these regions and determine which technologies and solutions, you know, existing ones and, and, and new, uh, new technologies, you know, would be best to address the objectives. And in doing so, we, we can develop specific grid architectures or designs and specific technologies that are needed to deploy on this regional customer level. So really this, this the reimagining the grid really comes down to thinking more customer centric and understanding what the need for those customers and the regions within the, in, in which they live, and really to think differently about how we design and operate the grid. You know, so we lay, we, you know, we laid out a, a future roadmap showing what grid components will be required, when, when those will be needed, and how we'll get there. Now, as, as again, as we're trying to work through and think through achieving the Pathway 2045 goals, and withstanding how it's going to withstand all these climate change impacts, you know, really creates a host of challenges from the electric grid perspective. And these expected challenges are driven by the customer, supply, and climate. You know, cus you know, our customers, our service area undergo is going to be going under changes of urbanization, the demographics, and other local factors affecting the economy so too will our customers' electricity usage change. And as, as the other panelists have, have already talked about, you know, the, the usage of the, the 
electricity for our customers, you know, we're going to be needing to adopt new technologies and enable the control of how and when the, the customers consume, store, produce energy. Um, and, uh, and as such, you know, the future grid must be able to accommodate and address the following challenges. You know, how supporting large adoption of DERs on our distribution system. Higher electricity usage and low density largely due to buildings, transportation, electrification, resulting in changes to daily load profiles in the time of the peak demand, as, as we were seeing, you know, our, our peak demand is shifting. Power quality is going to be very important too. The more we put in power electronics that the end users uh, place in their homes or in their businesses, you know, to power quality becomes a, a really key issue. And because of all the robotics or the inverters that we are putting in, the, the, all the different data centers, so we really need to pay attention to ensuring that the quality of the electricity electricity coming to these customers is of highest quality and doesn't cause issues with their equipment. You know, and really the customer's reliance on electricity is going to continue to increase, increase and evolve and it's going to be really critical uh, for their daily activities. The other challenge is today's resource mix is quickly transitioning from especially in California from traditional fossil fuel generation to variable inverter base uh, renewables like solar and wind along with energy storage assets. Um, in some cases this transition already has and will continue to present the you know some challenges here. Integrating high levels of renewables and delivering their variable output to load centers when needed. Ensuring resource adequacy. Make sure we have enough power on the grid to, to serve um, both the system and local with an evolving mix of these resources and maintaining grid stability and resiliency as conventional synchronous gen generation, the, the rotating mass is retired and replaced with renewables and inverter-based resources, we need to really know how we can uh, continue uh, providing what we call for the grid, for the grid stability inertia, making sure that it can ride through major disturbances and you don't end up with wide, wide, uh, system-wide blackouts. Um, and of course climate, you know, increasing climate risks such as extreme temperatures, wildfires, sea level rise, floods, really they directly impact the grid, uh, resulting in diminished performance, reliability, lifespan of grid assets, you know, perhaps we're going to have to start derating equipment, have different standards. It impacts our customers too, um, with a higher heat, um, and of course the the supply, less predictive um, hydropower because of droughts, and of course with extreme heats and fire. So as as you go to the next slide, you know. Historically, the grid has always been designed to provide safe, reliable, and affordable and resilient power to our customers. So today's grid, you know, it has been modernized to meet additional needs, including increased reliability, resiliency, accommodates the DERs that are coming on the system with, you know, distinct transmission and distribution architects architectures. Uh, you know, moving forward, grid planning, design, and operations will need to continue to modernize and shift from a singular focus um, on system-wide standards to one that really meets multiple objectives um, based on specific and localized needs. You know, some of these key changes include strengthening our four radar, uh, namely our ability to increase visibility and track upcoming customer supply and climate trends, get new, new technologies and power system issues to reduce future uncertainty, really to be proactive in, in all these changes. You know, moving from a deterministic planning approach, typically focused on a single worst case condition to more of a risk-based, multi-scenario and adaptive approach. Greater integration of generation, transmission, distribution, customer resources, really to optimize our, our planning and our operating decisions. Recognizing the heterogeneity of 
different regional needs, moving from a uniform grid architecture to region-based modular designs, really customer and region, uh, regional focus. And really incorporating all of these flexibilities into future grid architectures and technologies that can rapidly reconfigure and isolate portions of the grid while utilizing storage and DERs and controllable loads. Now, the reimagining the grid will be an adaptive evolution over time to achieve the objectives of Pathway 2045 while increasing uh, and addressing the increasing climate impacts. Um, it's going to, you know, and consist of these heterogeneous architectures, each integrating throughout T and D levels. Uh, more autonomous grid design making, especially at the grid edge, and responsive to dynamic condition, uh, you know, changing conditions. And the use of uh, one common bundled information operational technology platform as an enabler for the different capabilities and technologies with advanced cyber protection. And really these different architectures will be tailored to specific needs and locations using fit for the purpose of existing next gen technology. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there because uh, that's a lot of information. I know we want to get to some of the questions and uh, so I want to, there was one last slide, but I'll just, uh, you'll have all these slides I think will be posted on the website. Plus there are links to these two white papers that uh, you can uh, obtain the, the, the white papers and all the appendices associated with the white papers. So I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Dan. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, and yes, you're exactly right. Everything will be posted online. Um, and um, in the next week or two, we'll also have written summaries of all of the presentations. So everyone who wants to go back and watch the archived webcast, they're welcome to do it, but they can also scan the summary notes quickly to find and pinpoint the information they're looking for. Um, we will spend the next um, 20 minutes or so in discussion. So um, if our panelists can turn their cameras on, um, We'll start, uh, I have a couple questions and, I'm, and we have way too many questions from the audience that we can really address. So I'm gonna do my best to incorporate them into, into the discussion. There's a couple points I wanna dig into a little bit. And Monica, we'll start with you and then we'll kind of walk back through the, the order of presenters since it's been a while since we've heard from you. Um, each of you in your um, presentations have painted a picture, a pretty cool picture actually of how our homes and buildings will be interacting with the grid in new ways and um, innovation, interconnectedness, integration. You know, these are words that um, will soon define how we interact with our power system in new ways, but we're not quite there yet. And so I would love to hear your thoughts about what are the key barriers or challenges? Um, are they technological? Are they policy? Or are they human? Are they behavioral challenges that we need to address in order to really um, rapidly get to where um, we need to be with respect to the grid edge. Um, so Monica, we'll start with you and then we'll, we'll go through the panel. Sure, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and having, uh, you know, for our roadmap, we interviewed over 100 people and um, spent quite a few, bit of time over the last few years sort of asking this question. Um, from the building perspective and um, sort of grid, you know, from grid interactive efficient buildings perspective. And it, technology is really important, um, but I think we can, we can work on that, right? With continued investment, we can um, develop the technologies that are needed. In fact, many of them already exist. Um, from my perspective, it's really more on the regulatory side. As I mentioned um, in the presentation, today there really aren't very many incentives for uh, people to contribute. Um, to, with demand flexibility. And so I think if we really want to develop markets and, and new business models, we need to um, increase the incentive options that are available um, today. And then the other thing I would just plug is um, really, I, it's also, um, I, I mentioned this also, but the workforce angle. I think it's really critical that um, we, we put continued um, and, and frankly new focus on this. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of gaps in the workforce today. And if we really want to get up to scale and, and full implementation, um, we're going to need to have more people comfortable with the technologies that we discussed today. Thanks. Um, Elian, 
We'll go to you next. Um, yeah, no, I, so I think there are, there are three challenges. Um, I agree with Monica that the technological aspects of kind of integrating the ERs and transitioning to you know, the systems that everybody's described today, those are smaller and I think we can, we can uh, overcome those. The, in my mind, the three primary challenges are regulatory, behavioral, and uh, security, cybersecurity specifically. You know, from a regulatory perspective, I think there's, we're going to have to you know, change the utility business model. At some level, we're going to have to unbundle the distribution system like we've unbundled the transmission system. Because in order to allow these kinds of resources to proliferate in a competitive fashion, you need to give them equal access to the distribution network. Um, and so that will kind of ultimately give rise to the need to change how we regulate utilities. Um, you know, in addition to that, I think we need to think very carefully about equity. So as we kind of change how we regulate utilities and um, the proliferation of these kinds of resources, we need to think about whether these transformations adversely impact certain segments of society. Right? This has happened to some extent with solar and kind of the net energy metering policies that many utilities have used, for those of you who are familiar with that, ultimately kind of adversely impacting people without the ability to afford solar with increasing kind of fixed delivery costs that they had to pay being transferred from those with solar to those without solar. Um, behavioral, I mean, you know, ultimately the, the ability to control DERs owned by individual customers relies you, rely, requires you to engage with those, whether it's through new markets or incentives. And when you engage with those individuals, you need to ensure that the response you extract from them or their resource is reliable enough that you can actually use it to displace conventional generation or infrastructure. For instance, if I say, look, I'm going to rely on electric vehicles being flexible to shift load in order to avoid having to build out my infrastructure, I need to ensure that that's going to be available on a daily basis for 20 years right? with some level of reliability or assurance that I'm not going to exceed my network's capacity. Um, and then finally, security. I think it's absolutely crucial. We need to be very, that, 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 those, those, those challenges really need to be treated as a forethought, not an afterthought as we kind of expand the degree of control we're exerting on these resources at the edge of the power system. Because you know, malicious actors, whether it's through the internet or wireless, other forms of wireless communication, having the ability to take control of hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles and how they charge uh, could result in catastrophic consequences for, for the power grid. So, sorry, that was a long answer, but I, you know. Well, you're, it's fine because it was also a good answer. So you're, <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, Janet, let's go to you next. Well, it's um, heartening to me as I lead SEPA's regulatory in business innovation work um, to hear that Elian and Monica agree that regulatory is a, is a barrier, is the key barrier. I have great faith in technology as a non-engineer that the engineers will figure that out. But one of the things that we're seeing, um, not only is a lack of incentives, sufficient incentives, particularly around things like grid efficient buildings for customers to be adopting new technologies, uh, but the regulatory framework doesn't provide incentives or support for utilities to be deploy, deploying new technologies and making the investments in grid modernization that they need to be making in order to have these new technologies that customers are adopting in increasing numbers actually benefit not only those customers, but all customers, which gets to Elion's uh, equity point of view. So some of the regulatory barriers really are um, down in the weeds of regulation that utilities generally earn a return on a capital investment but that say buying services from a microgrid that is owned by a customer or a developer or some combination of the two ends up being just a pass through of those costs for them. And so they're less interested in pursuing something that's a pass through than something they can earn on. This doesn't mean that utilities are um, uh, the bad guys at the table, but like any other business, they need to be given incentives and have the opportunity to earn um, so that uh, when they're deploying things that are going to provide greater benefits to customers. The other big issue I think is behavioral and what I will put in that category is educating and engaging customers. 
we need a better understanding of how customers interact with electricity, how they use electricity. Time of use rates is a great example. Some customers will completely ignore the price signals. Others will react to them. Others uh, will react by saying, this is, I'm certain going to be bad for me, and therefore I don't like it without really understanding what it is. Um, there have been some recent articles out of Texas about utilities uh, doing some load management in terms of uh, controlling air conditioning thermostat sets that have gotten the reaction, oh, this is the terrible thing that the utility is interfering in my household or in my business, when in fact, actually, it's quite a good thing because if it's done right, it's transparent to the customer, but provides the utility with a great tool. So I would say education and regulation and regulatory policy are key barriers. Dana? Yeah, no, agree with everything that's already been said. What, what I want to focus in on, uh, completely agree about the, the regulatory and the policy, you know, trying to really uh, you know, enable affordability and equity uh, you know, shift uh, to more of a grid edge type of environment. It's going to be very important. Uh, when I think about the kind of the human behavior and the human side, I, from a utility perspective, we really need to look how we're going to become partners with our customers. Uh, really having that partnership with them to ensure that they are willing partners to, to join in on all of this. You know, we, we need to, like Janet was saying, we need to educate them why this is important and what this all means when when we have these different devices and communications coming into their homes. So we it's through the communication or the education and continued communication with these customers to help them understand what this partnership looks like and how they can help the, the power grid, but how it helps them also. And especially having this joint, hopefully this joint vision and goal of a clean elect power grid. Uh, so to me, it's it, gaining that, that partnership and that trust with our customers, I think is going to be very vital for us to do all that we've been talking about here. Thanks. Um, I want to follow up something that many of you mentioned, actually, I think all of you mentioned, is the idea of incentives um, to get, um, whether it's a utility or a customer, um, to either do something or make an investment in something or change behavior or something. Dana, maybe we'll start with you and we'll go in reverse order and try to do this as more of a lightning round. What are the types of, and this is a question from the audience, I should say. What are the types of incentives that we need and what are the information gaps um, that if we only knew more about maybe customer behavior or maybe how certain people would respond to something like time of use rates, what are those main information gaps that are preventing incentives from being deployed um, effectively? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, the incentives, I mean, from a customer's perspective, you know, they're, they're wanting to make sure what they're doing is going to kind of help their bottom line too, right? So uh, providing those initial incentives, you know, through the different type of programs, whether it's, uh, you know, the rooftop solar type programs through NEM, uh, really trying to build out the, the technologies, because as all that new technology builds out, the costs go down. So, you know, those initial um, financial incentives, I think, are important. Um, but we do need to continue to look at that. And once it comes to a certain point, maybe you don't need those financial incentives anymore. But I think continued um, understanding how these customers behave and I think some of the gap is that communication and education with the customers. What does this all mean? Especially when we're trying to shift to TOU rates um, right now. So really trying to help them understand what does that mean for them? Uh, and, it, and how just shifts in their behavior can actually save them you know, within their electric bill. Um, because especially as they're trying to electrify more and more in their home. So um, I, I think a lot of the continued communication and providing these programs to them uh, is it, going to be important to build out what we've been talking about here and having more of the, the, the customer side uh, technology that, that's going to get us to where we need to get to. Janet? I'm happy to go to you if you have thoughts on incentives and what the, some of these information gaps might be. Yeah, so I think they really do center on understanding customers and what they want. 
Um, and then making sure they have tools to respond to the incentive. So if you think about things like time of use rates, if they don't know until after the fact, um, uh, it's hard for them to respond. And one of the things that we've seen in our utility transformation challenge uh, that leading utilities have put in place is really engaging with stakeholders, engaging with customers to understand what they want so that you get right from them uh, what is needed in terms of incentives. Elion, from your perspective, what are the kinds of incentives that could get people to charge their electric vehicles at the right time? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, most importantly, the incentives have to be structured in a way that it's easy for customers to understand. Because through, through some of our uh, studies, we found that, you know, there, there are non-trivial transaction costs that customers incur and, in, you know, engaging with their smart meters or electric vehicle on a daily basis. We found that many people use the set it and forget it kind of approach to engaging with our program. Um, and so that, that needs to be taken into account. Uh, also different customers are motivated in different ways. I mean, oftentimes you'll find that the marginal value to be of behavior change to an individual customer in dollars and cents is relatively small on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, and so that may not be a strong enough incentive to, to motivate the kind of behavior you would, behavior change you would need at scale to actually have an impact. Um, but some customers are motivated by other things like environmental considerations. So understanding how to construct a diverse array of incentives that target different segments of your customer population is I think crucial. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the challenges that we've encountered in our work is you know, typically the kinds of people that you engage in these pilots are first adopters and are not representative of the broader population. So understanding how to extrapolate from, you know, what you learn from these smaller studies to a broader population, I think is a challenge. Um, so Monica, we'll give you the last word on this. Sure, I would just second the need for sort of customer segmentation. And I know we have found talking with different and sort of looking at different pilots that customers do respond to different incentives. And um, in fact, one of, you know, we have a funding opportunity announcement out right now for pilots on connected communities, which is looking just at, you know, one of the key questions we're trying to answer is better understanding how much customers are willing to, you know, sort of what limits they have, um, where an incentive will push, and then at a certain point where it's just, you know, people, um, the incentive won't be enough to change the behavior. So I think this is a really ripe area for further um, research. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I'm going to try to structure this last one as maybe also a bit of a lightning round, um, because I think it's really important and it incorporates some of the feedback we're getting from the audience. So our audience uh, is primarily a policymaker audience. That's who we're aiming at. And, any, aiming at, and anyone who's watched our session today has just learned a ton about grid edge uh, and uh, building to grid integration, electric vehicle to grid integration. But we're only one source of information. And so they may be hearing about this stuff from other sources that are saying, well, you know, this can't really work um, in practice. Um, the, you know, these systems aren't going to be as resilient. They're not going to be as reliable. Um, and I'm wondering if you have, Monica, maybe we'll start with you and we'll go through the, the order. If you, what would you say to someone who questions whether grid edge advancements could truly make our energy supply more resilient? more reliable, maybe based on what people have seen in parts of the country like Texas, where they've seen some, some pretty unfortunate power interruptions. And also, how would you, uh, what would you say to them if they were concerned that we might be inadvertently creating haves and have nots? So some customers are experiencing more resilient and reliable power, others are, are being left behind. Um, what would you say to, what would you respond to with that? Sure. I would say, you know, from the energy efficiency, efficiency perspective, we've been doing this for decades, I think. And for demand response, we have frankly, too. But we are looking at um, changing the paradigm and having, you know, just more dynamic approach. Um, and we have heard just what you said. Um, and that is actually why we are, we put a significant fund, you know, up to 65 million towards this funding opportunity announcement that I just discussed. Um, because we want to document um, some of these issues that you said, because we, you know, we've seen in pockets and small pilots that actually many of um, sort of the pushback or um, like you're saying, sort of doubts on the performance, um, that those don't hold true, but we wanna sort of document that at larger scale from a national perspective in different regions 
that actually um, these, you know, demand side uh, solutions will show up when needed. Um, so that's sort of been our take from Department of Energy was trying to sort of build out the, and demonstrate the viability of the solutions. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, Elion, what would you say to someone who says, yeah, your, your study is great, but it only applies to upstate New York. How are we going to, how are we going to ensure reliability and resilience on a, on a larger scale in places that are already having difficulties? I mean, I think ultimately, you know, one possible path forward to ensure kind of resilience and equity in terms of access to that resilience is to, is to share these resources, whether that's through kind of, you know, uh, innovative financing mechanisms where multiple households contribute to the, the funding and construction of maybe shared storage or shared solar uh, uh, devices. Um, so that if there is a, a ultimately a blackout or an outage, the, the value those resources would bring could be kind of shared across a much broader population in a more efficient way ultimately. Um, um, and you know, I mean, if we think forward, you know, to maybe utility 2.0 or what the future utility might look like, we may have new markets emerge at the distribution level where different customers can sell their flexibility or resilience to other customers that might value it more or less. Um, so I think there are multiple ways of, of kind of ensuring equity in terms of access to you know, the efficiency and resilience these resources will bring. Thanks. Um, Janet? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, sharing is a really important point, but I think the other key, um, key factor is to integrate these resources. What I would say is customers are already adopting these new technologies and in increasing uh, amounts, and they'll continue to do that. And unless we have the policy support um, and the regulatory framework that then enables utilities to integrate and take advantage of them, there will be have and have nots. We're setting up have and have not situations if we don't act. And so I think the key here is to put that policy framework in place that enables utilities to integrate these resources and use them as well as the individual customers who are deploying them using them. And that's how we will uh, benefit all customers and decarbonize the grid. And Dana, once again, you get the last word. <laughs> yeah, I, I think just as we were laying out in the reimagining the grid white paper, it's really focusing on the needs for the different areas within the power grid and understanding what those specific needs are, and especially if there are areas that are more disadvantaged type of communities, what can we do specifically within those communities to provide them the same advantages of putting in, you know, behind the meter type resources for resiliency or trying to create maybe community type of resiliency microgrids, if you will. So really understanding that it, looking at the grid and coming up with different architectures, different designs, uh, so that you are enabling all customers to have, uh, take advantage of, of these grid edge technologies and the behind the meter type of uh, resources so that they can be resilient in, in you know, blackouts or like with us for wildfires and, and that type of thing. So. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that brings us to the end, maybe a minute or two over, sorry about that. But um, thanks very much to our four fabulous panelists, Monica, Elian, um, Janet, and Dana. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you also for your flexibility and scheduling and understanding as we um, move the briefing to today. And also one last shout out to our friend Jared for uh, also helping us. Um, Four excellent presentations. I encourage everyone in our audience to go back and, and look at all of the slides and look at all of the notes. Um, it's a really cool topic. In some ways, we there's no way to do it justice in 90 minutes. Um, um, so hopefully, maybe perhaps we'll come back and explore the topic in more detail in another session. Um, we will actually be going on a bit of a briefing hiatus here at EESI. We um, have lots of really cool stuff in the works, um, but we don't have a briefing for a little while. Um, keep an eye out uh, next week for a save the date for our Congressional Clean Energy Expo, which will be towards the end of July. Um, and then we will, like most of the rest of the country, be taking a little bit of vacation time and um, getting back to um, sort of what people do in August in Washington, which is leave Washington and go find other fun stuff to do. Uh, we'll also be taking advantage of that little bit of time off. But 
never fear. We will be back from Labor Day and we have tons of good stuff in the works. Really interesting briefing topics. Um, two really um, important updates to some of our most popular fact sheets and issue briefs. So we will not be taking the time off. We just won't be doing much congressional education while our friends on Capitol Hill are out of town for extended periods. Um, so uh, again, best way to keep up with everything is to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Um, and that way you never miss a thing in case you're also on vacation, which hopefully you will be taking some time away. Um, we'd like to thank everyone in our audience for joining us today. Um, if you have a moment or two, we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we read every response. Um, we got one response at the, our last briefing about um, some me not wearing a tie. Um, that may not change before we go back in person, but it made me laugh when I saw who it was from and um, definitely read all of the survey responses. So thank you for that. Um, if you had any tech issues, if you have ideas, um, if you um, uh, have anything that you would like to share with us about today's session, um, please take um, advantage of the opportunity. We really do appreciate everybody's time uh, when you fill out the survey. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes at EESI for all of their help pulling off today and also um, rescheduling and, and finding a time and coordinating with our great panelists. I'd like to thank Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todoroff, Anna McGinn, Savannah Bertrand, Omri Laporte. And we have uh, a really awesome uh, group of summer interns, uh, Anna, Ashlyn, Irina, and Jackson. Thank you all for all of your help today as well. Um, we will go ahead and end it there. If you missed anything, just one last reminder, you can see everything, uh, archived webcast, briefing notes, all of that by visiting us online, www.esi.org. And we will end. Sorry for going a couple minutes over. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Friday and happy weekend.